coming back out to St. Matthew's Episcopal Church this evening for um, the second night of our Lenten series. Um, our speakers, for those of you who were not here last week, are Bishop Mark and Reverend Helen Van Kubry. Uh, Bishop Mark is the new Assistant Bishop for the Diocese of West Virginia, and uh, they have spent um, a significant amount of the last 20 years in um, Mozambique. Um, and uh, are here to talk about various, uh, <coughs> excuse me, various aspects of um, their life there, their experiences in the, the culture and the church. And um, this week, they are going to speak about the African worldview, the community and culture of Mozambique, and gender roles in family. Uh, last week, they talked about their background and how they came to be where they were and where they are now. So, um, without no further ado. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Helen. <laughs> I'm Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Each week during Lent we're going to be talking about different subjects which we were asked to talk about in the planning of, of uh, these Lent talks. Uh, and clearly, some of us, one of us will have more interest in it or more talkability in one area than, than perhaps another. And today will probably be more my voice you'll be hearing. Sorry. <laughs> um, but we, we have had uh, many years of experience living in a different context, a different culture. And we have many stories about that. Um, I just hope that what I put across to you this evening um, will be something that, if a Mozambican was here, they would be able to say yes. That's who I am, or you know, but yeah, culture, go, this, go this way. I don't know why. Culture is changing um, with development, which is coming very slowly to northern Mozambique. There's been rapid intergenerational change, which is a, a huge issue behind almost everything you, you, you think about. There are grandmothers who will still be wearing their capilanas. This is a capilana in their village, and there's another one on that table. It's the cloth that women wear, um, wrap their babies in, put on their heads, put on the cloth, sleep under. Um, there are, are people still living like that and, and in their villages as they've lived for centuries. Um, and yet their children were the ones who left, perhaps because of the war years and they went for education elsewhere. They've got Portuguese now. They've probably got jobs that they're, they're holding on to. Then their children, um, maybe know some English now, um, maybe have had better opportunities for, for education, and, and are in the computer and cell phone era. Um, and then you've got children who, who are growing up into all this, and the generations are just very different. I do think there's been rapid change uh, around the world, but when you're, it, when you're starting from a different uh, viewpoint, a different place. These changes are bringing huge change to culture. <coughs> so worldviews, uh, community culture, gender and family. <coughs> I think that to start talking about another culture that is so utterly different to where you are, and it is, it's utterly different um, to here, there's a paradigm shift that has to happen sometime in your mind. Um, you just have to try to see that it's, a, it's different. It, it is different. And, and I chose this picture because I wanted you to see. Could you tell me what that is a picture of? Cross, on the cross. Now, if you were to come closer, you would see that that is actually made up of arms, of um, weapons that were taken in after the war and made into all sorts of art forms. It's something that the churches that are part of the um, um, CCM, Christian Council. Christian Council of Mozambique, it was a project that they did after the war. So <coughs> I'm using that picture to show that you can't really understand. You can see the image, but you don't know actually what it's made up of. It's just different. You have to think differently. So another beautiful sunset from our backyard, as it was. Um, 
basic to the spirituality of the place where we were um, is an understanding of God. And that understanding of God was there well before missionaries came. Well before. The, the local language for God is Shauta. And that God was the creator God. And so the sky and, and, and the, the, the natural world is understood as having been made from God. There's a lovely museum place over in Malawi, the other side of the lake to where we were, where some Catholics have been working on culture um, and trying to understand uh, the mindset of the people where we were um, and the impact of Christianity. And they've drawn this wonderful picture of what creation meant in African traditional religion in that region. So that you see, Shauta is the God who lives above. And the way to connect with God, who created everything and sent everything to the earth, it looks like we're falling onto the earth, um, is through the spirit world. And if you, if you imagine that is in people's minds, um, rooted in their being, you can see how the Christian message fits in quite well. But you introduce Jesus into it. And I wanted to show you Woman. Can you, I don't want to distract you, but Helma, can you say, I pointed out that in this one, there is a picture of a woman with breasts, and you said that wouldn't have been as bothersome as, do you remember what you said? All African women have breasts. <laughs> In this, whenever a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned the same thing. He was in my hand. <laughs> breastfeeding in public is not an issue, but showing your upper arms would be and your knees would be. So, anyone who would like to go to rural Africa, please cover your arms and wear skirts. It's just a, but you can go topless if you want. <laughs> that I've had for several years that came from that place, and maybe you can look at it afterwards. Um, but there is Shauta at the top. It's that sort of smooth sun face at the top. And this has been put into the Christian message. So you have a nativity scene at the bottom on the earth. Jesus came to earth. And then you have different images of Jesus, which reflects the African worldview. So you have a young king. Um, a warrior king here and then the next picture shows someone who was a wise elder son and these things fitted into the culture as people understood it there but you can see how Christianity might be slightly differently understood to how it might have been received when when it, when it was in Britain <laughs> or when, when it came to America um, and I'll put that statistic there. 25% of the country of Mozambique would still be declared as African traditional religionists. But I don't believe that number because um, Muslims say the same thing, uh, all Christian religions say the same thing. It's a rooted belief system that you can still believe in another religion. You, you can have the two going together. And so people talk about people living with one foot in, a foot in different worlds. And it's very true. Um, and some of the first missionaries that went out from, from our church, the Anglican Church from Britain, understood that and introduced high church religion into an understanding of African traditional religion, which I'll talk about as we, as we go through. This is my picture of um, Ubuntu. Maybe you've heard that because I know Archbishop Desmond Tutu's talked about Ubuntu a lot. Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. -U -U. Ubuntu, and it means I am because we are. And you belong together and it's a circle of life and you live in community. And I exist because we do. Not you do, but we do. So we and us are used a lot, um, much more than we naturally do. If you think about how you describe 
whatever, you tend to sort of differentiate and talk about me and you. Just listen to what you say, perhaps. Can you move on? And then here's a village, um, which is just a, just a short um, distance away from where we were living. But that is to show you this community living in traditional life. Um, I remember, um, before I went to Mozambique, so 31 or two years ago, I was teaching in a mission school in Zimbabwe, and we were introducing um, the O-level curriculum, which is what it is from, from Britain, and the different ways that people would write about their home, you know, those essays that children have, uh, describe your home. Well, I know it was coming from Britain, so I know what the answer would have been. They would have wanted you to describe that house you know, like any house around here. But you had people there, young people there, describing their home as this. Oh, well, my grandmother lives in, a, in the round hut there. The cooking hut is over there. And, you, you know, it's just different. This is home. And this includes all the generations of your family together. But I'll come and, and describe that a little bit more. Um, because... Um, there's a different way of even thinking of, of where you belong because uh, there's such a thing as a matrilineal worldview. Northern Mozambique had matriline, was not patrilineal. Just briefly, it means that your children, be the children belong to the mother, not the father. And it's the, it's the brother of the mother who has authority over, there's still patriarchy, there's still men dominating women, but it's just, it's just that the, it's a key thing. The children belong to the mother. They don't take on the name of the man. And the man is the man doesn't belong in the in the in the mother's family. You know, we we've, we've had this issue with priests there. Do you remember when Kakong we got his wife, because she was the daughter of a priest, um, got the pension the Pension, it was a payout. Settlement, after, a settlement her after her father had died. And she got this money and she built a house with it. Well, in our minds, we're thinking, well, that's nice. Patrick, her husband, who is a priest, now has a home for his retirement. But no, later on, he comes to Mark and he says, I need my own home. That's for her family, which means the children and her. And I need something for. It's just very interesting. Marriage doesn't mean that you become one in the way that we understand it. Also, being a child in such a family is a much more collective experience of growing up. Uh, you could be on your auntie's back, or on your cousin's back, or on your mother's back, be passed around as a young toddler to any of a number of women. They are all your mother. Your cousin is your brother. And your auntie is your mother, and your uncle is your father. And we were, we were thrown off once when a priest came, was a young man came, and said that uh, his mother had died. And of course, we were very sad, and we gave him some time off. He went and took care of the, the needs. Six months later, he came back with tears in his eyes and said, my mother has died. <laughs> <laughs> Me being American said, yeah, well, I heard that one before. <laughs> And we had a little bit of a discussion. It turns out that it was his aunt mother who had died the first time, and it was his birth mother who had died, but both were equally, for him, his mother. And so the sense of being part of a collective is from right away, from birth. And it, it makes a huge impact on how you see the world. I have to tell you, I know experience it's very, very easy to come to another country and talk about orphans. And it will touch people's heartstrings and, you know, yes, let's start an orphanage. <coughs> that is not the African response to orphans. The extended family will take in those children whose parents, both parents, have been lost. They're not an orphan if they've still got one parent. Okay, and, and during the war, I, I mentioned last week that 200,000 children were orphans because had been lost their parents during war activity. Well, that project was written by an American psychologist. <laughs> but we found some of these kids, I used to make me smile, we found some of these kids 
in refugee camps, because you could go to a refugee camp and get up to grade four education, then after that, you'd go and stay with your uncle or your auntie and get the next lot <laughs> back in Mozambique. You know, and it's not separation from your family. It's very normal for children to be palmed out to their, to their families. I've had numerous women have said to me, why do you keep your three children with you in Mozambique? You've got a grandmother, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. But it's not what we do, is it? We don't give our children to the, our extended family to raise unless it's a trauma that's happened. You know, we died or, you know, but it's absolutely normal because of course, older people should have the company and the help in the home of a younger person. And then they can pay for their education and look after them. They're still your child, but they're part of a bigger entity. Next. Um, these are my pictures, which means a lot of them come from the places where I've served in churches, and this was my, my last church. This is Isabel, this lady, who, uh, from Kua, so she's coming from over on, in the ocean, and she was raised Catholic. But they never baptised her, so she went through everything. So she came to our church and I, I just really want to be baptised. So she went through our little programme and she got baptised. But it wasn't just her, it was her entire family that got baptised. The whole family moves into that, the church. So those girls next to her are her grandchildren. And you can't see, but she had two daughters that also were baptised the same day. And behind, just to say... Um, behind, that was just one side of the church that had children for baptism. We had mass baptisms. Baptism is vital for in, in this context. But it's like, I've heard it's like, um, I don't know if it's medieval uh, Anglican church or, or just a couple of hundred years ago or what, but you did. You had community baptisms en masse. It wasn't just one or two, but the whole community brought their new babies and that was it. This um, baptism was a couple of years ago. Just before I left, the weekend before I left in, in November, we had the third baptism of the year in this church, and 70 babies were baptized. 7-0. And that was less than the other two baptisms. They just wanted to make me work before I left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and also, you always have a baptism just before a bishop arrive, uh, comes, because he's going to do the confirmations. Can you go to the next? And this was the confirmation just before we left my church. Um, I seem to remember it was something like 110. Um, and that was, the, I think, the second time last year that we had this. So 250 young people every year joining that one church. Yes, it was a big church, but you, you, it was just always big. I remember when we first went back with Marcus Bishop in 2003, and there had been two years without a bishop there. So there was a backlog. And there were places where he was going and 300 or more were being confirmed. I still have the blisters on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and the first one we did, it was the middle of summer. And this is the, you know, my first ever service as a bishop. I wanted to look right. I had everything on me. <laughs> <laughs> Things that bishops have worn for hundreds of years. <laughs> just to look right. It's 98 degrees. 98% humidity with a zinc roof and 320 candidates to be able to do I melted. Just like the witch. <laughs> I got Finally, after an hour and a half, Helen said, that's it, you're going to kill your bishop. The first day, we're going to have a halftime. <laughs> so we had a halftime interval where I could get some water, take off the chasuble and the miter and everything, and cool down a bit. And then we started all over again. <laughs> um, the next one. Now, because you've got this great understanding of baptism, and it really is good, you, you are a member of this church until you die. And it actually is about death. People want to know where they're going to end up. And they want to know that their families are going to end up that way. And, you know. But it does mean that in between these times, there are so many different groups for people to participate in the church. Um, I had, just in the one church, three youth choirs. Um, there was the young girls, which you'll see later, called St. Agnes. This was the picture taken on our last service in Nampula on our way out to here. 
Um, and you can see we've got acolytes there, we've got deacons, we've got two bishops, we've got a couple of archdeacons. Um, you haven't got the Mother's Union in there, then that's unusual, but you've just got a huge range of people that are involved in the service. Um, the readings would be done by three different people. Somebody would read the New Testament, somebody the, 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 the Psalms, somebody the Old Testament, and then the priest or the deacon would go forward with the gospel. It's just finding different ways to get people involved was absolutely necessary. And churches were run by the church wardens, um, which is great. <laughs> um, but I just want to, it, it just, it was exhilarating, but also it was something that would just seem to happen in front of you because it's a webbed re relationship. It's a webbed way of connecting with everyone. I, you know that I, we mentioned last week that I'm doing some studies at the moment, and, and I had this really good thing that I learned. I, this was too big for me, and I don't believe in one person leading a church. It's got to be team ministry for me. But I was doing this to, as a favor for the bishop because we'd had some issues, and, you know. So I was, but it was too much for me. So I remember at this one... It wasn't issues between us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, yeah. Anyway, so I was given this, this job, and I thought, well, this is just too big. There's just too, it's just too much. And then we did this study about the webbed relationships that go on in, in, in that could be going on in, in churches. And I saw how my church wardens worked. And I saw that if I was connected in well with maybe 10 people, then that, that was fine. All the visiting didn't land on the priest. It was to do with the different teams and the different groups going and doing it. I was asked to do things if it was a sacramental need, like they were about to die or, um, you know, baptism of baby, or, but, but visiting the sick was done by individuals, done by groups. It, it was an interesting thing for me to discover, because I thought, ah, oh, that's how I can do this. But you become a different sort of leader. I think you become more of the, the teacher and the visionary, and, and you just have to relax about what else might be going on visiting. But it was just really interesting um, to see how, how this was all worked together. And I do think that um, we, we started to see a, a greater openness to people from outside as well, outside of these tight webs where actually the names were occurring. You'd have the Kakongwis and the Missoulas, and which is a bit like the Smith and Jones, you know, everyone involved. And this was taken sometime last year when we had a planning meeting and we invited uh, the partners who were from overseas. So we've got Australians here, Americans, this is the representative of the ERD here, um, along with all the different sorts of leaders that we had within our church. Um, and it was just a really interesting and good discussion that we had, really eye-opening. All are included. And you can't exaggerate that. All are included. Um, so there's the St. Agnes group on the left there. That's, that's a group that is for girls between the age of 9 and 16. And they're basically overseen by the Mother's Union. Um, and they're involved in lit liturgy. As you can see, they're bringing up the elements and the, and the, the offering to, to the altar. Here, on this side, is a march that we used to have every Palm Sunday that got bigger and bigger each year. And I'm sure we had 2,000 two more? 3,000 people that walked from the middle of town out to one of the churches we changed each year. But this one year they were coming out to, to, to my church. And you can see everybody joining in and they're holding palm branches because, you, of course, you've got palms growing there. You've got the real thing. <laughs> and um, you'd, you'd bring in people as you went along, and, and it was just great. <clears throat> and we had a building project in my, in, in my uh, last church, and um, I learned a lot through that as well, that for people to own, own the building, I, we, we received such a lot of money, really, to build this church that I was worried that it wasn't going to be 
owned by the people. I mean, what do you do about cleaning a church if they think, oh, it's not our church, you know? You, it's constantly thinking about sustainability. So we, we worked hard when we had to put the roof on and when we had to finish the floor up and things to involve everyone. And um, my church warden, one of the church wardens was that man in the red there, um, who I've already said I learned so much from. But we, we worked really well. And you can see little girls got involved, looking, getting bricks from outside. The young people came and they had a whole day there when they were carrying in things to, to put stones on the floor. And, and that's the church wardens and the other elders of the church cutting down the grass. You don't understand that that's actually an amazing picture because you would, it's very easy to get the women doing this work, this, this work, but to get the men was just almost made, had me in tears. <laughs> <laughs> because of course this is women's work um, around the hearth, around the cook pot, um, doing that kind of, of work. And that's where the conversations happen. That's where... Um, you will because, because it takes hours. It's not a it's not a microwave. It's it's, <laughs> it's cooking things from absolute scratch. Beans that have to be brought in from the field. To, chickens. I do have a really nice picture of some women plucking chickens. And when I showed my daughter that, she almost gagged. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't show people things. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the uh, basic food. Um, starch that they're making here. Notice the baby on the back. It doesn't mean that's her mother, as we were saying. It could be any baby <laughs> of any woman. It just happens to be, need to be on the back of someone. But that's called, in our, in our local language, nshima. And it's made from corn flour. Corn uh, in Africa is white, not yellow. And it's flint. It's very hard. So they put it in a mortar and pestle and pound it. And they get a rhythm like this, a pounding. These, these things are huge. I mean, I'd last about a minute. And, and they've got four arms, you know, like Mike Tyson. Yeah. And off they go, pounding, 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 until it turns into a flower. They sift it, and she can see her putting it some in this big pot, and just keep stirring and cooking, stirring and cooking. First, you have to make the fire. Then you have to start cooking the shima. And then on the side, the radish. It will take four, five, or six hours to prepare a meal uh, for a big group of them. Next. Um, we did have a, we are, it's still going, that there is a very good project, a community health project that's happening uh, along the lake shore for 20,000 people, which is run by volunteers within our church. So these women here volunteer almost 24-7 for this because it's their community. It's them that have uh, got um, midwives, traditional midwives, that have received some extra education and training over, over that. But they were already doing it. Already, they are the ones who deliver the babies. And um, this, this project is ongoing, and that's a good thing, health. I told you, I think, last week that I, I think the... Um, age of uh, life expectancy at the moment is something like 47, 52 years. Um, so clearly health is, is vital. Um, and when we first went back in 2003, we were in a boat going up the lake shore with our three children who at that stage were six, nine and 11. And it started to rain. Now the rainy season starts at the end of November and goes through to April when you get this you get this really heavy rain once a day, um, and it's, it's warm, it's summertime. And this rain started whilst we were in this boat, and the two women were sitting next to Mark, and they said, oh, now our children start to die. Can you imagine? And I could hear this, I mean, uh, uh, along, along the lake shore. But this man, showed me something else about community health in that context, in those worldviews. This man um, was a witch doctor. Now I want you, when I say that, to, to clear your heads of what you do at Halloween or, you know, fancy, you know, clear your heads of that. It's a, it's a real thing that happens, that is, in rural Africa. And he doesn't walk around in black and, and it doesn't, but he does have 
things that he makes spells with and concoctions that he, he's making. And this man, um, it's a long story that I'll cut right down, but he came to one of these major baptisms and confirmation things with uh, services that Mark and I were both at. And Mark had given me, <laughs> don't be the bishop's wife. He said, Helen, you can, you can talk afterwards, you know, just to, you know, you just get up and say something. So I got up and said something, and I told them a story of, of um, something that I had heard, actually, back in Durham, where, where as I said last week, I had become a Christian. Um, he, he talked about um, a bright white light talking to him. And I remember this man in Durham saying how he had once had a, a, a vision, a, a sort of dream of um, dying and coming to heaven and going through the pearly gates and, and coming before this bright white light. And it was so white and bright that he felt so terrible because even though he felt like he'd been a good person on earth, he, so he was about to turn around and leave and Jesus arrived. You know, you stood up for me on earth, I'll stand up for you here. A picture of forgiveness, complete forgiveness. This man was listening to me telling this story and I remember him because he was staring at me and he was wearing this bright blue jacket, which you can't really see there, but underneath it's bright blue. I think it's a woman's jacket, just staring. And when we had finished the baptisms, um, Mark had asked me to say, you know, it was an altar call, which is not my, my thing, but this guy came forward with 40 other people and they were baptized as well. And this man went home and, and got rid of all his, his uh, witchcraft things. Mark visited a, a year later and he was still really strong with the church and he was going through the discipleship program that we had going on. Now I'm saying these things to people that, I don't know how you're receiving that, um, but to me it was absolutely amazing that through one person, healing had come to the entire community because he wasn't going to be practicing his craft which puts fear and death into a, a community. I can say death because I used to think too that, oh, this is just, you know, this is just imagination or this is underdevelopment or, you know. But actually one year we had a witch doctor come over from Malawi to a church on our lake shore um, trying to find the culprits for a boy who had gone missing and they presumed dead because on Lake Malawi lots of people drowned. It would change very quickly. And this boy had died five years before and he was coming to find who the culprits were. And there were three or four people that were asked to go into this cave up this mountain. And if they didn't go in, then it would prove that they were the ones, you know. So, so they went into this cave and they got beaten to death in there. Witchcraft and that kind of whole, men, whole way of looking at life and not understanding why something has happened and putting it into the spiritual is still very much alive and very much part of rural Africa. The, the very countenance of this man's face changed. No one would stand next to him during the service. It was, everyone kept their distance. He was known and for evil. And after he was baptized, the, the smile came on his face and his eyes started to open up. It, it, was, it was an absolute transformation of this person's life. And like Helen said, the whole community changed. It's like they all just breathed a sigh of relief. They were free. So these you will see are some reality checks about uh, what people are living with. And, but not just recently, but over generations. It's the, well, the UN goes between, it depends how you measure it, between the sixth and the eleventh poorest country in the world. Under five mortality of one in seven. Absolute poverty of 54%. Absolute poverty means less than a dollar a day. Illiteracy at 65%. Again, that changes depending on where you are. I know that there's some people in where our diocese was, 
some women who would be, it's 55% uh, illiteracy, but I know there are some villages where it could go up to almost 80% illiteracy. Life expectancy, 47. I think it's creeping up now. Undernourished, 47%. And the undernourishment starts in the womb, when the mother isn't eating properly. Can you just go back to the, the, the bottom? Ah. There's 1.2 million orphans. 20% of children in Mozambique, they say, are orphans. And 24,000 child-headed households. There in, our, in northern Mozambique, there are 16, 16% uh, of um, households are female-headed. What does that mean within a matrilineal culture? Um, matriline kind of goes in a band like that across. So there, there is a similar matrilineal heritage going over into Zambia and, and southern um, Tanzania that's been really messed up with the war, that, such a long war, um, and extreme poverty, chronic poverty. But it does still exist. Can you go to that? So this is one of the, yeah, one of my friends in, in this church. That's Anna in the middle there, the oldest one. She's 75 years old. Anna can't speak a word of Portuguese because she's not got any, I don't think she's got any education, so she's completely illiterate. And she lives with her family. So there she's got, her, her daughter is sitting down there, and that's her grandchild in the orange top on the left there, and then two of her great-grandchildren. They live together in, in Lushinga. That's the vision of a female head, head household. And what's delightful about Anna is that um, because we can't communicate very well, maybe, but I think she does it with others too, she dances and sings her, her faith and her answers to any questions. So, how are you today? And she's sort of, it's, just, it's really lovely to be with her. And I put this Capilano here because she gave me this when I left. Um, but I won't say any more about that because otherwise I'll get upset. <laughs> and this, this is an urban home. So she lives in the city and in relative modest uh, circumstances, but you can see she's got a freezer here in the corner. So there's the three women are working in different ways for this one household. It's today on the Beyonce. Beyonce. Yes. Jay Z and Beyonce. <laughs> So we'll stay with this slide for a little bit because there's some, just some pointers here as to the different paradigm that, that people are possibly rooted in. What is truth from below as, as from the poorest? Um, somebody I read recently talked about poetic echoes and um, how myth and symbols are very important. And I know that from the church perspective, which is why I think high church Anglicanism really appeals, because it's very visual. Um, we have incense and, and lots of <coughs> things like that, to, to, and dance that, that, that makes it visual. But for example, when you're talking about money, and this is quite an eye-opener, this was an eye-opener a few years ago, that there's such a thing as hot and cold money. Now, nobody will tell you that, but you know that they're treating some money that you've given in a different way to if someone else had given it. So hot means it's a money that you have to give back. So it could be a close relative that's lent you that. Um, cold money, basically, you don't have to give it back. So NGOs, possibly churches, I don't know, depends on, you know, how much you know, how much you're involved in that person who gave you that. There's, a, there's, an, atti there's, a, there's an approach that goes with the money. Um, recently I heard that, that people talk about vanishing money. Well, I know that even in our context, money seems to vanish, doesn't it? But vanishing, literally. But I had that and now it's not there anymore. You know, there's a spiritual way of understanding what's happened. Um, and how do you get hold of money? 
you know, how whether whether it was got through through ill-begotten gains or or you earned it, you know, it's, it just changes the flavor of that that money. It's not they're not people do not have the same approach to money that I see here, where. Um, and and Britain, where where you make it for yourself and you spend it, how you, yeah, it's it's complex, it's very complex. And then we've got the limited good. We talk a lot about the common good, and it's part of our law, isn't it? Common good. But rural African might not have that. It's more of a limited good. The cake is only so big, and I can't get any more of that in a normal way. And so it's a common good. And if I make, if I get more, someone else is going to lose. It isn't about me making more and me improving my life. Life just doesn't seem like that. It's a limited good. Can you imagine how that would change our whole way of doing things if we weren't thinking of the common good? Can you also see how the message of Christianity is, is tweaking that? Because we talk a lot about loving others, doing things for other people, and, 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 and it's just changed that limited good. Because it's about survival. So much of life is about just survival. You know, somebody, we've got an, had an ag agricultural program going, and, and people would take a year or two to actually practice that, because it's life and death. If that new practice isn't going to work, we're not going to have enough food next year. It's that important. It's not just an experiment or a, oh, let's try it out. It, no, it's life and death. And then we've got zero sum. I can only earn as much as I can. Even if I work harder, even if I work longer, I will not make any more. It is a, it is a, a mindset that's come out of long-term poverty. But you might interpret it as laziness or, or not wanting to better yourself. But it's, it's this whole zero-sum game that is going on. And it leads to questions like, why are white people rich and black people poor? You know, what's going on there? An example of that, our neighbor uh, grew a potato field and had an abundant harvest. And he invited us over to have some. And we congratulated him on such a good harvest. But he didn't look happy about it at all. We said, what's the problem? He says, my relatives are going to start coming. <laughs> as soon as they hear that I have extra potatoes, Uncle John's going to come and want to eat some. And Aunt Bess is going to come over. And that extra harvest is just going to be eaten away. He will not benefit from the extra harvest. It's not for his good. It's for everyone's good, and so it ends up being a zero sum. You work extra hard, it ends up the same as before, only as many potatoes as you can eat. But then it comes to the moral economy, as I wrote there. It's exactly, this is everyone. You don't keep it to yourself. It isn't just for you. There are certain words that are used in local languages that describe people differently. So a rich person, a, a good rich person, is someone who shares all that. They, they do have the potatoes to, that you can come and have. You know, it's just a very different way. And then on top of that, do we recognize ourselves? The question that I gave at the beginning. Because I can be describing the people that I was living with, sure, for a long time, and I'm, I'm trying to be honest about, about that. But it's been the way they might, the, the people in our churches might be living has been affected by, first of all, what missionary culture was given to them 150 years ago when the UMCA first went there with their ideas of high church and, you know, that came from Britain. Um, it could be coming also from an understanding which has been more recent, um, but we have a lot of this in our diocese. People who say we are born again and they've had some sort of a charismatic experience but we're born again, so it's the born again. And they, there's a separation there, and a different way of seeing um, life in that too. And then, as I said at the beginning, there are still a high percentage of people in traditional religion, and also meshed between the, the two. So how much is coming from 
deeper than rootedness. So I remember waiting for a few months at the morgue, and some Muslim women that I knew were there, and they came to prepare the body. You prepare your own bodies. The churches prepare their own bodies for funerals. There aren't um, professionals doing this. So I was waiting for the women of our church to come and prepare this one body, and these Muslims came and prepared another body. And then I remember this woman saying to me, that, Mama Elena, that's my name, Mama Elena, we're all the same because this has all been so new. It's only 150 years ago that the missionaries first went there. And it's only around the same time, because of slavery, that the Muslims were converting en masse to save themselves from slavery. You know, it's not very long. When you think of the hundreds of years that, that we've had the European influence in, in Christianity. Here we go. So, and this worldview will be from your birth. Go through. You are involved in responsibility, in uh, respecting your elders, in looking after the family. These are children selling fat cakes on the street to support family. Or they've been left, their mothers have left them to do this to support the family. Okay? And it, size does matter. This girl is old enough to carry her younger sister on her back while she goes off to play. But we, you know, I'm sure she was only about six years old, the old one. So what does childhood mean? You hear a lot about child marriages as well in Mozambique. And I know Grassa Michelle, who was married to Nelson Mandela, um, she's tried to influence people to think about later marriages, which would come after the traditional initiation ceremonies. Um, but it's just I, I, I see these I see these news articles come out and they talk about young marriage. Well, it's called marriage when you have a baby. It doesn't mean to say they're being married <coughs> legally or in a church or legally in any way. It's, it's having the baby is the marriage. But they might not even be living together. It's very complex. Is this her baby? Yeah, yes. Uh, no, that was her um, sister. I put a picture of Sylvia up there to remind me that matrilineal might have ways of women living together that support one another when things go bad in their lives, but also there's a dependency on that system. Sylvia is a wonderful woman who was our mother's union worker for many years, and in this picture she had just been telling us that she'd lost her eldest son, who was 30-something, and she was devastated. That's her insurance, that's her pension. And now she hasn't got that. And this is a good woman who is strong in her faith, good woman. And I doesn't, yeah? Go ahead. Finish that, finish that thought and then I'll ask. And there's another woman I know very, very well, Rosa. She lost her grown son as well in his mid-30s uh, a year ago, I think it was. And she, you know, people are black for however long. If it's a close member, it's meant to be for a whole year. And um, you can decide, as long as it's 40 days, at least 40 days, you're wearing entirely black. And she got so depressed during that 40 days um, that she didn't actually want to go out. She didn't, and this is a very outward person, you know, very gregarious. And she didn't want to go out. And the women came to me and they said, we've got to take her black off her because she will not recover from this until we do. And there was a special ceremony just for women that I had the privilege of seeing, but the women prayed for her and they took off the black that she was wearing on her head and they put on color, a, a color capilana. She didn't want them to do it, but they did it for her own health, her own spiritual health. Hello? John, you, sorry. You've mentioned Mother's Union a couple of times. Could you explain that? Mother's Union is um, an international women's movement within um, the Anglican Communion, which we are a part of. Uh, they've got four million members in the world, and I think it's, it's about one and a half million are in Africa, something like 800,000 are in the UK, and then they've got quite a few members in India. But it's Africa that really is the strength of it. And I think just the little I've told you about women's lives there and... and I think you can see that it's a valuable organization for women to be part of. Whether they're married, whether they're 
separated or whether they're elderly or it's just a very solid organization for, for women to be together as women and to support one another at those difficult times in life and the good times too if you have a baby or you know it's just a um, I really I really am very positive about what what that organization does and um, I know that it became a very special organization within our diocese growing three times during the time we were there to 3,700 because they were involved in pastoral work in teams in, in churches so they were valued um, older women would, would be key to the visiting that I talked about earlier the pastoral visits um, and the praying the delivery of babies the helping in the fields if you happen to be sick when your fields need harvesting all sorts of things and very very prayerful Thursday mornings Every week, there was a prayer um, meeting or else a, a, a mass with, with the priest. They were, they were the backbone of every church. And woe to the priest who crossed one of the mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Where do the men fit in this? <coughs> there is an organization for the men, Ben Adam Mizeki, but the women are also part, there's some women who are part of that as well. Um, how long have I got? <laughs> it, is, it is interesting when you compare other men. It, the men have the authority. You, we could have a meeting with all the church wardens from around the diocese, which we did do last, sometime last year to talk about various new policies and things, and it's mainly men. And yet the churches are full of women. You three, know, it's three, men that. Three quarters of the congregation would be women and young people, and one quarter would be men. But all the leadership roles. The formal leadership roles were held by men. There are many informal roles where women uh, exercised authority and power, but they were informal. The formal position almost always had to be men. There was, did you say this last week about the end of my... Uh, we've been speaking in different places about Mosley, I'm getting confused. But at the end of that building project that we had, and a bishop came to, to, to uh, what do you call it? Bless the church, to work in the church. Well, yeah, but there was another bishop, oh, okay. bishop that came as well. Very fancy, went on for five hours, and we went out to the front, and then I was taking off my robes as I came back in, and one of the women who had been really supportive during the, the building, she came up to me, and I, I've told you already, I'm called Mama Elena. Mama! church means there, building-wise. That's what a church would start off as. Clanch and mud. And then these were other buildings. This church on the left here, um, this was the church that I inherited, and then we built that one next to it. And that's another one in, in uh, another, the other end of the diocese, and another one in our town. All built by, by, by members. members of the churches. And when she says built, she means Every brick was formed by their hands, put into an oven, cut down the trees, put the, the firewood in there to burn the bricks, and then laid in the bricks. Handmade in Mozambique. Now we're in Lent now. There's a, there's a, <coughs> oh, wait. There is a really um, important service which is happening every Friday during Lent in Mozambique. Uh, where a catechist, so it's not extra work on the priest, <laughs> but a catechist, will, a lay reader, will take this service every Friday very seriously, and quite a few people will come to it, and particularly women, I have to say, but it's, it, it's important. And it's the Via Sacra, and you're going around the different pictures and meditating on you know, Jesus walking through to the cross. Um, station, to the station to the cross. This is a station... Um, of the women in Jerusalem crying. I want to read you something, I, I did write it myself, but um, about the Via Sacra. Can you go to the last picture? A 
an irreplaceable heart healing Lenten practice for our Anglican High Church heritage is the Via Sacra. It is for all ages, men and women. It is most popular in the Lakeshore language, Nyanja, and it is the end for the weekly Friday fasting and marks the end of Lent at the Good Friday service. The journey of Jesus towards the cross of Golgotha connects to both remembered and present paths. Around our church are 14 beautiful paintings from Tanzania, closely resembling art of life there. Babies are tied to backs, women lead mourning, figures are disproportional. But the liturgy makes up for the gaps, the bodily movement for kneeling, prayer, reverence, sharing the carrying of the cross between the pictures and the readings and reflections. It is dynamic communal prayer. There were more young girls in the group this year. That was last year. For one, I know that her mother died recently and now she stands where her mother did. Connected now in a way that rural Africa knows better than urbanized <coughs> Europe and America. Her cousin is with her, sharing her grief in being the one remaining. I noticed Maria, a woman my age, who once told me that her mother hadn't loved her enough to let her go to school. And I noticed one old man, Ngomondu, always the one to raise criticisms of changes. People say PIDE, P-I-D-E, the Portuguese secret police during the colonial times broke him. He chose to carry the cross at a picture of Jesus falling, and I pray silently for him. And then Surya takes the cross, a colleague whose sight is failing with advancing diabetes. Maybe I understand why she's carrying that cross today. The Via Sacra journey touches us with the purpose of Jesus and his life-giving sacrifice. He fell, got hurt and stood up again, offered help and showed compassion, saw grief and pain, and reached out to comfort, right to his last. I do think those early missionaries left a major blessing in some of the services that they left for the high church, of the high church there in northern Mozambique. Another service is a requiem that I was doing requiems almost every Thursday with the women for people that had died previously and it was a way of reconnecting with that grief and helping people through the, the stages of requiem. And during Lent, there are no requiems. They wait until after Easter, when the promise is real. Thank you. Are there any questions? What language did you most commonly speak to the person? Portuguese. Always Portuguese. Always Portuguese. And do they have native languages? Yeah, we had we had eight languages used in our diocese, and I think there are now 45 living languages in Mozambique that they use. But not every language has got a Bible in it. Or so, Portuguese is the language of education. So you are meeting most of your people with that. I think in my church there might have been five, six old women that maybe wouldn't have understood Portuguese, but. If you've got 500 in front of you, then, you know. <laughs> Did you both speak Portuguese prior to going to Mozambique? No. 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 Uh, in rural Mozambique, uh, all of our services would become local languages. And all our sermons had to be translated. And any pastoral care had to be translated, mm -hmm. which is very difficult. Um, we were there in the 90s. We first of all went to Mozambique differently, different times. At, uh, Mark went in 87 and me in 89. And then we left there in 96 after marrying and having been working together in the north. So we had those years when we'd been learning Portuguese. So when Mark was elected as bishop to go back, 2003, we had Portuguese already, yes. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what are the economic opportunities? Yeah. The economy is primarily agricultural. Yeah. Although uh, Mozambique economy is uh, the apple of the eye of most of the Africa right now. It's risen tremendously with the discovery of, of a lot of natural resources. <coughs> Connection to West Virginia, coal and gas. Um, and all that that brings to a community, as we were just talking about, good and bad, 
and I've heard that so many times here about the love-hate relationship West Virginia has with coal. Well, it probably turns lights on for them that they haven't had. Yeah. And so that's what you have to remember. <coughs> you know? Did you say the is there any family unit as we see it, or is it more for female days? I focus a lot on matrilineal, not matriarchy, it's slightly different. It doesn't mean that women rule, it means that it's about the family, okay, it's different. Um, I focus a lot on that because there's such a lot of women that have been abandoned by their men, by the fathers. And <coughs> oh, you know, poverty, or oh. And I actually think that because there's something subtly different there. If, the, if those children weren't yours, you know, you, you were maybe freer to, if you couldn't deal with it, then, you know, so there's a very different relationship in northern Mozambique to what I first knew when I first went to Mozambique, um, which was along the middle part there, on the, on the corridor, um, that's just very different. And, well, and I think there's more dignity for women to be children. Like what you said about the uncles. Uh -huh. So in other words, I was thinking like, my brother would be somewhat responsible for my children, right? Yes. And so then... Um, my, our children would go to Helen's eldest brother mm -hmm. to get permission to marry, oh, okay. to decide where to go to college. Not me, not the father, the uncle. Do they know their father as a birth father? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do the fathers live with them? It's not a nuclear, it's not a nuclear family situation like we know it. It's an extended family, but all living together. There's, there's nuclear parts within that, but there's this extended communal connection, which is uh, part of daily life. One thing I didn't mention is polygamy. There is still polygamy, and I think because that's sort of being beaten down a bit too, that some of that might be involved as well in, in men not really staying with one woman. But, you know, because it's, it's not frowned on. <laughs> it's, you know, I can't tell you, you know, the counselling, sitting there, just sitting silently while this couple are telling me their issues over, she, she doesn't want this polygamous marriage, and he he, I just don't know what to respond. Didn't know what to respond. <laughs> if you let people talk long enough, they work themselves in. <laughs> is it, what's the ratio of women to men in Mozambique? Is, is I it 50 50 or very, or very or close to 50 50. Is it? Okay. Uh, right after the war, there were fewer men uh, because more had been killed in the war. But not, it wasn't a typical war of armies fighting. It was a guerrilla war and the uh, the guerrillas often attacked communities, and so women were just as likely to be killed as men. What were they trying to achieve in the war? To destabilize the country. For what reason? Take well, it was, remember, it's apartheid was still in South Africa. The goal of the South African government was to destabilize the black independent neighbors because their greatest fear was invasion, not upheaval from within. Uh, invasion from outside. And so that was one of the tools. One of the tools used was to support these opposition movements, which became armed opposition. That was the South African government. The apartheid South African government, the national government. Was the war ethnically based or was it politically based? There was an element of uh, tribalism. Um, in that there's sort of a natural division between North and South Mozambique. And uh, those involved were very savvy uh, in recognizing that that was a division to be exploited. And so they made use of that. And the repercussions are still felt today. Headlines out of Mozambique yesterday was, the war has come back. <coughs> the, the opposition party has taken up arms again not satisfied with uh, what's been happening in the elections, they're claiming there's been fraud, the government doesn't want to negotiate, so they started attacking uh, the main highway again, the convoys. And uh, so we've been praying a lot about that here. Yes. 
is a person's relationship in, as being a Christian and their relationship with Christ seen as a relationship in their life or the relationship in their life? Because I got the impression we talked about the traditional African traditional religion that you could there was sort of room for multiple views, multiple relationships. And I'm curious when you think of traditional Christianity as the way. And sometimes that becomes divisive because of the exclusivity of it. Is there room for other views, or is it very linear? I, I, my, my understanding, I think um, because Jesus is involved in it, it makes it different to a traditional understanding. God and our relationship through spirit life and all the rest, I think that we slot Jesus into there. He was the one who came down and lived this life that it brings hope. That's what I think the hope is. And I think because the poor find their hope in the church, <coughs> that that makes it real. Now, are they Christian because they choose to be or because their family is, is another question. Because we've known also villages become Christian. You know, so is it, I don't think it's in the sort of evangelical sort of get on your knees. It, 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 you, your community becomes Christian. Of course, it's, 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 it's like, like here too. You can find this continuum. I mean, right. we have people in church for different reasons as well. Uh, different kinds of experience, different places in a journey uh, in their relationship. <coughs> and you can find that throughout the church in Mozambique at least. But I could introduce you to many that say Jesus is... I love you. I mean, you know, yes, it's really Lord and direct Savior. relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Was there any Western medicine or was it uh, local herbal uh, type? Um, you know, when we talk about witchcraft, there are two kinds of. Yeah, there's there's traditional is, healer, which is absolutely. Yeah, you converted. Yeah. Took all the medicine away. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there are traditional ways with herbs and stuff that you've. Or, or, sorry. That you find, um, which I think you 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 might agree with. You know, there are things like that now for us, aren't there? You know, so that's fine. But it's when it goes into actually spells on people that it, it's cursing. Yeah. And yes, there is medicine there, but the local we had a local hospital um, a few a couple of years ago, I think it was. Mark got ill and he went to the hospital and they wanted him to stay in. I thought, please, let me take him home. <laughs> no, he, he went in really badly, so he has to stay in here for the weekend. And then this woman doctor said to me, you know, I'm here, so I'll check on it. Well, that very night she was broken into, so she didn't work in her house. So she stayed at home all during the weekend. She never saw my husband. You go in every day, you have to take the water for them to wash, the water for them to drink. You have to take food in, you, you, just everything. The sheets on the bed. And we've got all sorts of, that weekend was really horrible. And I wrote to my brothers and I said, please, if you ever hear that I've gone into the hospital in a shinga, send a plane. It's too late for Mark, but at least I can. Our local hospital could deal very well with malaria. But anything that was a little bit, and you know, you know when someone is at the end because they send you home, and you, that person knows that they're going home to die. This hospital isn't going to do anything more for them, and they're not going to send because they did have a fund. They would send them to the hospital in Maputo four hours flight away. But if they thought you, you know, what's the point? All they just the sent you home. all the mission hospitals were nationalized by the Mozambican government when it became independent. So there were no mission hospitals in Mozambique, which was the backbone of the health system of all the neighboring countries. We lost all of that. And that was a, a huge, huge problem for healthcare in Mozambique. The, the community health project that I mentioned there, actually what they're doing is, you know, what we might learn at school even, you know, if you can measure your baby, the weight, and you know that you've got health. And that's basically what some of the really basic community health work is. It's just being, going to different people and, and doing the basics, yeah. There's 55 longevity <coughs> older down in the, the uh, surrounding other African No, it's a bit lower in most of you. But it is low because of the under five death rate. Because there are plenty of people in the 80s and 90s 
I've, I've got a, I could have put a lovely picture of 100, I think she's 110, they told me. I don't quite believe that, but you know, it's possible if you get past, if you get past age five. Father <laughs> <laughs> John, there's a curfew tonight, I think, so we'll be able to have those. Yeah. Thank you.